Thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, Zoom training session. No, actually, it's the launch, of course, of Suji's um, Just You and the Page. I'm Mick Felton. I'm the publisher at Seren. And I'm very proud, actually, to tell you that Seren is um, celebrating 40 years of publishing this year. Um, for those of you who don't know us, we publish a wide range of books, um, poetry, novels and short stories, memoirs, biographies, pastoral writing, heritage and leisure titles, current affairs and literature, lit crit and books about writing. So uh, amongst that list, it was very easy to find a place for just you and the page, a book that includes authors in so many of those fields. And um, on our old fashioned letterhead uh, is the phrase well chosen words. And that's what we're about. We're about telling a story in the best way possible. So it was also very easy, <clears throat> excuse me, to find a place on the list for a book by Suji, who, as many of you know, has made a career out of well-chosen words. And what a body of work Sue has produced and what a book um, she's adding to that body of work this evening. If all the authors under consideration for just you and the page had been included in the book, it would be twice its already considerable length, or perhaps more, uh, but for a variety of reasons, not everyone could or was able to be included. But the various authors we discussed showed just how well connected Sue is in the literary world and how well respected she is too. And as for the dozen authors that did make it into the book, what a stellar cast they are, what a range of genre and styles they allow Sue to present in the book. Some of them are with us this evening. I can see some of them on the screen now as, um, as I talk to you. And perhaps, perhaps they'll chip in later with a question for Sue. Before I go on too long, I just want to say what a pleasure it's been for all of us who work here at Seren to work with someone of Sue's experience and judgment. The process of making this book has reflected her long publishing background and the professionalism that that background has provided her. We've held many events at Seren, uh, both live and recently uh, online. And perhaps one of the most common questions that authors um, have to field, and perhaps the reason why so many people attend these events is, what's it like to be an author? And where does your inspiration come from? Perhaps just you and the page may provide some answers. And over either to the video or Sue, I can't remember which. Just You and the Page opens in 1971 with the dramatist Michael Wall hammering out his plays on a portable typewriter. It concludes in 2020 when the novelist and academic Josie Barnard is teaching students to compose novels on Instagram. Between them are Booker Prize winners, a poet whose life was changed by a profound religious conversion, a translator for whom Pushkin has meant everything, a lecturer whose first novel sold a million copies, a distinguished environmental journalist, a novelist who is also a political activist, a famous barrister, a nature writer who restored a wood, and a political activist who fled her country and is writing now in exile. When I write, I want to smash through something. For a novelist, the most valuable rule when observing other people is to tell yourself that nothing is as it seems. Writing is something without which you die. I knew I wanted to leave Ireland. It's a love-grief relationship. I always felt that words were my friends. Writing is a light inside me which nothing can turn off. What would you say you stood for? Honesty, 
honesty and accountability? Yes. My diaries are very considered pieces of writing. One of the strongest motives that drives me to write is curiosity. You have to recreate, not reproduce. Translation is a new beginning. How can the self be bigger than the nation? I do think leaving Ireland helped me to write about it. New technologies have fundamentally changed what it means to be a writer. Okay, well, Good evening, everybody. Thank you all very much for being here. I think some of you are in London, some of you are in Herefordshire, both places very important to just you and the page, but so is Ireland, so is Wales, and Poland, and Russia, and Iran. And through the work of the writers in this book, it does cover quite a lot of ground. I'd just like to return the compliment to Mick and Sarah and say I really thank you both and the whole team at Saren for looking after me and the book so beautifully. I'm very proud to be published by Saren, so thank you. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a bit of a talk telling you how the book began and more about it and more about the writers. Then I will conclude with a reading from the first two and a half pages of the book, which is the first essay by the dramatist Michael Wall, who you saw in that first, in the sequence of photographs, he was the first, standing outside the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester in 99 with the production, first production of his award-winning play, Amongst Barbarians. I'm going to begin by reading the three epigraphs I've chosen for the book, which clearly, obviously, I've chosen because I think in different ways they reflect its spirit. The first, comes from the painter Gillian Ayres, a very fine colorist, abstract expressionist. She talking about painting, but actually what she says is just as much to do about writing or any creative endeavor. The secret inside painting, not to be spoken of too much, to be kept at the back of the mind so that it stays as a questioning, a searching, a hope within us. Then, Willa Cather, the early 20th century American writer, her editor gave her this advice, which I sometimes give to my students. Find your own quiet center of life and write from that to the world. And the last is from Flannery O'Connor, American, so dark, so funny, so wise, who said in a lecture once, I hope you realize that you're asking me to talk about story writing is just like asking a fish to lecture on swimming. The more stories I write, the more mysterious I find the process and the less I find myself capable of analyzing it. And so say all of us. I just want to ask before I go on, is my voice okay? Can you hear me okay? Yes, okay. So where did this book begin? It actually goes back a very long way and it began life, in truth, as a novel. It goes back to 1972 when I had been living in an attic, paying three pounds a week for this little room overlooking, overlooking Hampstead Heath in North London. And I moved from there to pay eight pounds a week to share a large rambling two floor flat with six other people overlooking Highbury Fields, also in North London. It was a very vivid time. I think perhaps most of us in our lives can say there are certain places where we say, okay, that was a turning point. This was definitely a turning point. We were all quite young still. The spirit of the 60s was still with us. We were quite idealistic 
and we thought of money as a means to an end, not an end in itself. You'll meet these characters in the um, essay that I read at the end of the talk, but one of them, Michael Wall, he made us laugh a lot, and he was quite different from the rest of us in that most of us had what you might call a job. Mike was living on toast and the dole and announcing himself as a writer. We became friends and remained friends, and indeed that's true of other people who lived in this flat. Time passes as it does. We all went on to do other things, but I always knew that one day I would want to write about this time and that place. And about, it must be now about four years ago, I thought I'd finished, I'd just published a novel, Trio, and I thought, well, okay, maybe this is a moment to settle down and write about those hybrid days. And I very much conceived a vision that was a novel, and I sat down and I began, and the whole thing was completely inert. It fell flat on its face. I think partly because although I have written novels where I've based characters on real life, on the whole, they're very much invented. And I found myself trying to invent people who, who I remembered so vividly, who needed no invention, who didn't want to be translated into somebody else. And the only time that this material dead on the page had any flicker of life was when I started writing about Michael Wall. So after the usual um, despair and self flagellation and why did I ever think I could write anything, I thought, okay, let's say it's not a novel. I'll try it as a memoir. And I began to write about Mike with one remembered incident. And as soon as I did that, the thing took off. So I then wrote a very long essay, well over 25,000 words, about Michael and his life and his extraordinary work, work as a dramatist. What could I do with that? Answer precisely nothing. It's very, very hard to place an essay of that length anywhere. However, in the meantime, I had sent to Mick Felton another quite unrelated essay, and he said he couldn't do anything with that either, but he liked it enough for us to begin a conversation about the possibility of a book of essays about other writers. And gradually, a sort of constellation of people writing in very different genres, most of whom were old friends, began to take shape. So you've seen their photographs and the statement which each one of them has made, which appears at the head of each essay. But I'm now going to tell you just a little bit about each one of them. So Michael Wall, we will meet again. We'll leave him on one side. Penelope Lively, household name, prolific, award-winning, much loved. Um, someone whose life began in colonial Cairo, which she was forced to leave at a young age. And that severing of the tie with her childhood home and people there I think provided some kind of wellspring for her work, which had been so preoccupied with history, the past and memory. Hilary Davis, I haven't known for so very long. We met about four years ago. She's a very fine poet. She's published until now by Enitharmian. She has a tremendous range, long sequences about the Napoleonic Wars or cave paintings but also very fine lyric poems, some of which are about her grief at losing her husband, the poet Sebastian Barker, who I'm sure his name will mean something to many of you. She is the person who's had this profound religious conversion to Catholicism, quite unexpected, and she's written wonderful poetry about that as well. Anna Burns. Anna Burns I have known for a long time. She started to attend the bookshop events in Stoke Newington that Charles Palliser and I used to run together many years ago, long before she was beginning to even to write, except with much hesitation. I now really do think she is one of the finest writers of the 21st century, and I'm terribly proud to have her in this book. She's won the booker for Milkman, and Milkman, like her first novel, No Bones, is set in the troubles of Northern Ireland. In between is a novel called Little Constructions, which is 
anarchic, absurdist. She's completely original. And as I say, I'm very, very glad to have her here. Ruth Pavey, very different, a nature writer, as we say now, or perhaps don't say now. Not so many women in this genre, so it's great that Ruth is here. She bought a wood 20 years ago, and she spent 20 years conserving it, planting trees. She's written a wonderful book about it called A Wood of One's Own, and she's just this last week with Duckworth published her second, Deeper into the Wood. And she's someone who is very aware of the effects of, on the natural world of climate change, which she writes about without a hammer in her hand, but a voice which is very persuasive. Marek Mayer. Um, I lived with Marek for almost 30 years. We married six months before he died, far too young. He and his sisters were born here, the children of Polish ex-combatants who had arrived after the Second World War. They grew up in poverty, but they were very nurtured children and each has gone on to do interesting things. And Marek became I'm proud to say, one of the finest environmental journalists in the country. If you haven't heard of him, it's because he wrote for a specialist journal, but it's also because, as I say in the essay, he hid his very considerable light under a very large Polish bushel. Roy Strong, who has sent a message, Roy Strong has just moved house in Herefordshire. He's tired, he may not be with us tonight, but he sent a very affectionate uh, good wishes this evening. I met Roy Strong through Hereford Cathedral, which is very important to him and which my now husband and I attend. And he has been a good friend. He's had such an extraordinary life, full of contrasts, we all know most of the things about Roy Strong, but what I focus on is his diaries, which are merciless, unputdownable, pinpoint accurate, and over 50 years provide a portrait of those decades, which I think will last always. Charles Palliser. Charles and I used to run author events in Stoke Newington Bookshop, and that's where Anna Burns came one night and stayed. Charles is best known for a novel called The Quincunks, Victorian Gothic, an amazing piece of writing, which did indeed sell a million copies and was translated into at least 12 languages. He's written other books since. He's a writer, actually a very great variety, although people associate him with Victorian Gothic. He is a calm, kind, courteous person who writes about very dark things and in the essay we talk about that and try to discover why. Anthony Wood. In Anthony Wood's house, he and he and his house and his wife Hazel's house, I wrote my first novel in the basement surrounded by spiders and bicycles and at the top of the house Anthony who had left John Murray to found his own publishing company, Angel Classics, European Literature and Translation. He was always working on something to do with Pushkin. He discovered Pushkin in his early 20s and he, on the back of an envelope or in publications, he'd been writing, trans publishing translations of Pushkin for decades. And last year, very excitingly, he won the Read Russia Prize for his selection of Pushkin's verse. So we're all very excited about that and very glad to have him with us. Dara Martin, I know perhaps less than anybody. I met him at Right to Life, the writing group in Freedom from Torture, um, where I was a mentor and he at that point was an administrator. He's from Dublin. His first novel, Future Popes of Ireland, is clever and funny immensely readable and a very sharp look at contemporary Irish history, at the church, at Catholicism, at birth control, all the major, major issues which made us make us read about Ireland. And he does it with such a light touch. So I'm very, very glad he's here. Now, right to life. That is where I met Afra, which is not her real name. Afra was a teacher of literature in Iran. 
she absolutely had to flee Iran and seek asylum here, which I'm glad to say she was granted really quite quickly. She writes in poetry and prose. Her work is distinctive and passionate, and I commend her to you in the book. And finally, Josie Barnard, with whom I've been teaching in the past, a great colleague, a great writer, author of two fine novels published by Virago, Poker Face and The Pleasure Dome. And she's also written travel writing. She's a broadcaster. She's a journalist. She's one, someone who's worked in many genres, and she's brought that whole idea of multimodal writing into her latest book, The Multimodal Writer, because the great thing about Josie is she is absolutely with her finger on the pulse in the digital age. And her task now as a, as a teacher and as, an, as a writer is to enable writers, creative writers, to use the digital world as well they, as they possibly can. It's not easy for everybody, and Josie is very aware of that. But she is very creative, and in the last year of the pandemic, when, as we know, university students were really struggling with doing everything online, Josie, who's now Associate Professor at De Montfort, must have been an absolutely great person to have on board. Okay, so there they all are. Now, when I was putting this book together, what I did, as well as read these writers' work and interview them and write about them, was read around the whole idea of publishing a book about groups and groups of writers. And I, I, there are several I read, and they're in the introduction, so I won't go through them all now, but I'll just mention one or two. One was a, a really interesting book called The Violet Hour by Katie Rolf, which looks at how great writers, including Freud, Susan Sontag, John Updike faced or failed to face their death. Another is Lindsay Gordon, Outsiders, How Five Women Writers Changed the World, a really lovely piece of literary biography, looking at lots of people, five writers, including Mary Shelley and Virginia Woolf. I looked at others, and what began to trouble me was that they all had a very strong overarching theme, facing death, turning to feminism, living with difficult men, uh, becoming political activists. And what I had in contrast was all these very different writers. And then somebody recommended me a book which really helped me. And that is a book called Dear Shadows, Portraits from Memory. It was published in 19, 1986 by the late critic, poet, and novelist, John Wayne. And all he's doing in this book is writing about people who have now gone, but who once meant a great deal to him. So he's writing about Marshall McLuhan, with whom he had a long friendship, but also about a Welsh hill farmer, a landlady, his father. And this book gave me courage, really, because I thought he just pulls together people he admires and likes and feels are worth writing about, which is exactly what I have done. But then I also began to realize that actually there is an overarching theme to this book, because I don't think there's a single person in it who has not at some time in his or her life had to overcome something huge. It may be extraordinary, like having to flee your country. It may be not as dramatic as that, but each one of them has overcome something. Not one of them has given up. And all of them, and some into great old age, have continued to write work which is fresh and important and inspiring. So I, I salute them. I didn't think I was going to say that, but I do salute them. And I think that the book is fundamentally about creativity and resilience. So I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to conclude by reading these two and a half pages from the opening of the book after the introduction, which is about Michael Wu. Each of these essays, as I said, has a statement at the beginning, and this is the full text of Michael's. When I write, I want to smash through something, lack of feeling, indifference, cruelty. 
I'm shocked by callousness or indifference. One of Mike's great themes was the English abroad, and he looked at them with quite an eye. And now the text begins. Someone is talking to himself in the bath. It seems that a soldier has returned from the front to find his wife in the arms of another man. But what is this? I was going to write you a letter, darling. There follows much laughter and splashing about. Then the taps are turned on and the geezer roars. Eavesdropping on the long dark landing outside the bathroom door. I can't hear what became of this doomed wartime couple. But I'm dying to know. It is the spring of 1972. We are still in the age of the geezer and the dreaded pirate light. We are deep in the age of time out with its yards of small ads and five of the seven of us now sharing a vast two floor flat on Highbury Fields, North London, have each answered one. We've been through a long selection process as Claire and Anna, old university friends, made their choices. We each have an airy bedroom. I paint mine purple. With a lonely job in publishing, I've come from a tiny attic in a rambling, run-down place overlooking Hampstead Heath, even larger than the one in which I now find myself, sharing with six people I'm getting to know. Claire, dark curly hair, appealing blue gaze, has a much more impressive job in publishing. It's the age of Tom Mashler at Jonathan Cape, and she's copy editing the Rachel Papers, a first novel by someone called Martin Amos. He's Kingsley's son. She's also read Kingsley himself. He won't let you change a comma. Anna has a pre raphaelic cloud of red hair and lovely skin. She's teaching at Goldsmiths College, right across the city. Cultural studies, though it wasn't called that then. Who else have she and Claire selected to live here? Jackie is a potter, tiny, pale, with wistful looking dark brown eyes. Improbably, she has married Jay, a tall, lanky American photographer who yodels at the kitchen sink and at 30 is older by far than any of us. Patrick is a postgraduate art student treating his bedroom as a studio. Tall and loose-limbed, with long curly hair and a gorgeous smile, he spends hours listening to music with Mike, Bob Dylan, The Beatles, the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, Pink Floyd. It is Mike, Michael Wall, who talks to himself in the bath. He talks to himself all the time. We can hear him trying out scenes in his room. We can hear him hammering away on his portable typewriter. Brought up on a council estate in Hereford, he left school at 16 and is the only one of us without a job, living on toast and the dole, announcing himself as a writer. There are books on his shelves by writers I barely know or have never heard of. Jean Genet, Richard Brautigan. On the table, there's a heap of manuscripts in ancient folders, half-finished plays and rejected novels. There's also a chess set, spirited away from his last job, a packer in a gift shop factory. On Sunday afternoons, he teaches me to play. He's good and chess means a lot to him. There's something of Ian Forster about his appearance. His clothes are ordinary, jeans and old shirts and jumpers, but he has a wine-coloured velvet jacket for special occasions. Wearing this with newly washed hair, he's adorable. The first time we kiss, the morning after a party, I remark upon the moustache, and is that a bit of a denture? He tells me that he lost a number of teeth while hitchhiking in Europe without a toothbrush. It's not until much later that he reveals that he was born with a cleft palate and a hair lip. The shaggy moustache conceals the scar. The denture hides the wounded, toothless palate. I have forgotten the cat. The cat is live and black and adopts us from who knows where. It's Mike who gives him his name, Spassky, 
after the Russian chess champion. It is Mike who puts him down on the electoral roll as a merchant seaman. But he's a serious person. I can't see the point of life without writing, he said once. And he went on to compose award-winning plays for stage and radio, which were way ahead of his time. It's Mike who will be the first of us to die. This essay about those distant Highbury days is about him. It's about you, Mike, after all this time. And there I will stop, and I'm very happy to take questions, and especially if any of the authors in this book are here and want to ask questions, of course, that would be great. But from any of you, it's lovely to see you all. Thank you very much, Sue. That was certainly a great introduction to the book. Um, so, so far I've had one question come through, but just a reminder, if anyone would like to ask one, if you could either type it into the chat by using the chat button at the bottom of your screen, or you may already have it open on the right hand side, um, or raise your hand or wave and Mick is looking out for you and I'll unmute you and um, you can ask your question. So I'll start with this one that we've had come through, but if anyone else wants to ask one, um, let us know. So this is from Ian Grant. Um, Sue, your new work is a rich weaving of writers' lives and words. Do you also sense its revelations about you? It feels vigorous. Is the work an optimistic testament of your own self? Uh, well, it is a crossover book, and I meant to say that, so I'm very grateful to you, Ian, for asking that question. It's a crossover between memoir literary biography and literary criticism, because I do look at the work of these writers in some considerable detail, really. Um, what did you just ask me? Is it a testament to my marvellous life? I, I can't remember. What did you say? So, yeah. so, do you sense its revelations about you? And also, secondary, is the work an optimistic testament of your own self? Well, I'm not quite sure if I know what you mean by that, Ian, but but what I do feel is that strangely, I'm now living at the other end of the road in which we all lived in the early 70s. So I'm now at the top of Highbury Fields. And when I began this book, I did think with tremendous sort of leap of the heart, really, well, I've brought something, I've brought something to bed, as it were. I've, something has made a circle. Um, and I'm bringing back people who have gone, like Mike um, and Marek, um, and I suppose, I don't know how optimistic it is, but I try to be optimistic, that's all I can say. Nick, is there anyone else who's got their hand up at the moment? I'm not seeing anyone. I can see Anthony Wood does, so I'm going to ask to unmute, or if you could unmute and then feel free oh. to say. Um, can I be heard? Yeah, we yes. can see you now. Um, so you knew some of some of these um, writers pretty well, and uh, some very well, and some more recently. Uh, your uh, you, you knew. Was there much variety in in them surprising you with, with when when you really asked delved into their lives? Did was there, did some of them really really surprise you, and and, and you you didn't. You, you, they really added to your knowledge of them, your your interviews with them. Or, or, um, I mean, if it, can you think of one or two who, who really did surprise you and revealed much more than you knew from your own previous knowledge of them? Well, certainly, I think that the writers that I didn't know so well, uh, who I met more recently, like Hilary and Dara, I was getting to know them. I mean, we had already become. Began, begun to be friends, but I certainly was getting to know them much more closely in the interviews. Mm. Um, whether I was surprised, I think it seems rather invidious to talk about individuals by name. Do you know what I mean? But no, we don't name them. Right. Name them. No. no, well, I won't, but I will just say yes. I got, I got to, I won't say I was so much surprised as I felt I was being let into. A, a greater depth of understanding about these writers and their relationship with their work. Does that does that sort of answer that? Yes, you were sometimes surprised. I, I never fell off a chair. I never fell off a chair, but um, certainly I did find myself getting to know people much better. Yes. 
Thank you. Are there any other questions? I can see Juliet Woods got her microphone unmuted, but I don't know if that was intentional or not. Do you have a question, Juliet? I don't at the moment. No, no, I just, uh, I was just drinking all that in. I just cannot imagine how Sue, how, how you are able to achieve so much and so broadly and take such broad interest in so many different different writers. That's it. I, I, I'm, I'm truly overwhelmed. <laughs> I think Ramey might be wanting to ask something. Mm. Is that right, it's Ramey? Good. I'd like to ask you how you limited yourself to two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve people. Was that hard? Yes. And there the are. other question, I've got two. And the other question is, did you ask everybody, like in an interview, when you interview somebody, did you ask everybody the same questions, like, what is writing for you? Oh, um, no. no. No, you I, let it flow. I, I was more interested in people just letting people talk. And some people talked really, I can think of one or two who talked with immense eloquence. And I, I did, of course, put in questions, but essentially I was there to, to listen to what they wanted to tell me. Um, I did, of course, have certain questions I wanted to ask. But on the whole, I was keen to let people talk as they wanted to talk. And as for the question of selection, yes, there are several people I would dearly love to have had in this book, but it's already so long and so thick that I, I simply couldn't. So that's unfortunate. Volume two. <laughs> Not for a while. So we've had one come in, another one through the chat from Nicholas Clee. Oh, yes. Were most of these interviews conducted with the book in mind? Do you think the writers responded so congently because they were in sympathy with you as a fellow writer? Yes. Everybody knew what I was about. Everybody, I approached each one of them and said, I'm, I have this book in view. I would really love you to be in it. Would you like to be in? Yes, was the answer. And so they did know what I was about. And yes, I think, I think it's, although of course we use the word interview and I tried not to interject too much. It was at least at some level a conversation between writers. I mean, I sort of knew what people were talking about. Do you know what I mean? I, I could, uh, in, a, in a way, which if they'd been talking about engineering, I'd have had to ask a lot more questions. So I think we were, we were, we were right. We were within the same frame, intellectual and and creative frame, I suppose. Thank you. Would anyone else like to ask ask a question? Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask something or, or if you're waving at Nick. <laughs> oh, I can't see anyone waving. Any of the other authors would like to say anything? Oh, it's Jackie Kathin. Jackie, I yes. you are unmuted. So yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Sue, um, wonderful that you're back on the page, but um, uh, 12 writers. Are you in there at all? Are you in there between each writer or uh, in the introduction or at the end? Is there I, I hope, any of your lovely writing in it? Well, I hope my lovely writing is the book itself. Do you know what I mean? I, I am there yeah. in the introduction very much. And as I said, it's a crossover book. So I do appear, but I'm certainly not somebody who's going to publish a book and say, by the way, I'd just like to snuff in my own essay here about something completely different. I feel that's not not what it's about. Um, but yes, I'm certainly very much in this book. Thank you. Very good. It's Kate, was that Kate? I think that was Jackie. It, yes, but there was somebody Kate flashed up ah. on my screen. I'm not sure if it's the Kate I think it is or another Kate. No, the question. Yeah. Did anything you heard from other writers change how you think about your own work, Sue? Yeah. I mean, it's not possible to spend time really looking at a writer like Anna Barnes, who is a complete, I, I wouldn't say anybody is a complete original, and she acknowledges that she's very, very influenced by, by Russian absurdists like Gogol, but you read her and you think, we are just on different planets, really, in terms of what is achievable, you know, I, I just, I can only say that I, I suppose as you get older, you have to learn to think, okay, this is what I do. It's not Anna Burns, it's not somebody else, it's what Sue G does. And so I have to be strong enough to um, own that, as they say, 
rather than thinking, oh, I wish I was somebody else, I wish I'd written this, I wish I could do that. Um, having said that, you know, you one always hopes, I do hope that I will continue to develop as a writer and, and come up with something perhaps completely unexpected, which I wasn't expecting to write. That's a very interesting question there. Thank you. Supplementary to that, Sue, it is the Kate you think it is. What did you say? It is the Kate that you think it is. Oh, right. Very good. Where is she? Just amongst things I've right. so, um, Charles Palliser has also sent a question to me here. So, Sue, if you could have put a long dead writer into the book, who would you have chosen? chosen? Dickens, Jane Austen, and what would you have asked him slash her? I, I, I would have to say Catherine Mansfield. I would have to say Catherine Mansfield, um, who has been a profound influence on me and on so many writers, and not so long dead, Penelope Fitzgerald, who is, you know, one of the finest 20th century novelists. Um, what would I ask them, did you say, Charles? Yes, I think that was it. Yeah, okay. Uh, but I mean, they, those are the people who immediately come to mind. I'll tell you someone I would do is very sadly, these people who die too young, Justin Cartwright, I don't know how much his name means to all of you, but a really fine novelist who died much too soon, about three years ago. And had he been living, I would very much like to have had him in the book, but, but never mind. But long dead, George Herbert, really quite long dead. And do you know what you would have asked them? I really would have to think about that. It's the kind of question you put to people and they have a week to answer it and then put it in the Sunday paper. Um, for a future time. <laughs> I, I suppose I want to know from everybody, really, what writing means to you, what it's done for you in your life and what you've hoped to achieve through it. And perhaps I would be asking that question. But, but you see, some people like Catherine Munster wouldn't have given a direct answer to that. This was foolish. Do you know what I mean? Conversation yeah. has to be tailored to individuals, doesn't it? Mm. I'm not making a very good fist of this answer, sorry. I've got a question. Great, go go for it. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Dare I ask what you are going to work on next, Sue? Uh, I am at work on a, a series of very long short stories. In lockdown, I, I didn't write this book in lockdown, but I edited it in lockdown. And then I wrote a number of pieces for Slightly Foxed, a wonderful quarterly, which I'm very, very pleased to be able to write for from time to time. And I then started, I thought, now is the moment. I've got these ideas I've had for a long time. I haven't had time. So I, I, I've written three very long stories. I don't know if they're ever going to find a home because um, on the whole, people are short in this age, but that's what I'm working on now. And I have a file of others awaiting my attention. Would anyone else like to ask anything? Um, so, um, a question about um, technical terms. Do, do you see, is there a difference to you between a, a long short story and a novella? And have you begun either a long short story or a novella? And when you began it, you thought you were writing one sort. And when you finished it, you, you thought you, you, you decided you were writing the other sort of story. Uh, uh, is there an important distinction or any distinction to you? Anthony, you're the expert on the novella. We've had this conversation, I think, over the years because none of these short stories is as long as 30,000, which I guess would be the minimum for a novella, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, so I'm talking, when I say long, I'm talking about maybe 15,000, which is too short. Yeah. Isn't yeah. It for, I think, I think it's a off who wrote quite long stories and very short stories. and. Yeah, but, but I mean, when does a when does a short story become a long story and a novella? And I, I'm just interested because in German there's a structural difference that a novella is a short novel, and and a story a short story is a short story, and a story is a short story. And if it's a long story, it might or might not be a short novel. So I mean, that's just German. Sorry, sorry. Germans are perhaps quite more particular than than we are, perhaps, or classical German story writing is. So yeah, I just wonder where you stood in this. 
I, I, I have realized one thing. I did realize something a couple of years ago, and that is that um, in a short story, it has to, what was it? I had this sort of insight that, you know, you, that it doesn't, if you added something to it, it wouldn't add any more. Do you know what I mean? It's got its shape. It's got its limits. You've said everything that needs to be said in that length. And mm. I was thinking of a particular story of mine when I realised that. And I thought the material is such that you could say, well, why don't you turn this into a novel? And the answer is because you wouldn't be saying any more in a novel than you're saying in the short story. I think that's a very, very fair summary and distinction. Thank you. Okay, so there's two more questions come through in the chat, and I think that's probably all we're going to have time for. So I'll, I'll put, put these last two to you, Sue. So Annabel Cullen says, you say that overcoming some crisis or hardship is a unifying theme for the book. How much do you think this was also a catalyst to their writing, what they write about and their creative process? Well, that's a huge question. Thank you very much for it. It's a huge question. For example, Anna Burns, um, her childhood in Belfast during the Troubles is the wellspring of her art. Um, and that's the most obvious answer I can give of a writer who's very clearly drawn on experience, but turned it into art. There's no question about that. Um, I don't know, I don't know if I can answer off the top of my head how many of these writers have used the struggle to, um, as the basis of material for their work. I, I don't think it's so much that. I think it's more... Um, a determination. You've overcome something and you're going to overcome something else and you're not going to give up and you are committed and you are dedicated. Um, I think it's more that. It's a question of tenacity more than life informing art, if you like, struggle informing art. And I think there's one more question. And that's yes. perhaps it. So the final one comes from Emma Graham Harrison. Mm -hmm. One of the quotes you shared talked about writing as a compulsion. If I remember right, something like, I must write or die. Was that yeah. a common theme? Was that? A common theme. Well, I'll, I'll answer that obliquely because I thought if anybody asks me tonight, what would you say, what would be your statement at the head of an essay? I would have to say that I think writing saved me. And I think that's true of a lot of artists. And I know it's the, the one writer I can think of immediately who said this is, is Rose Tremaine, who said that without writing, she would be a very melancholy person. And I think that's perhaps true of me. But it has given me a huge a drive, a huge um, the pleasure of being somewhere else that's not me and not my place um, to enter another world. And... Um, just to ask your question once more, Sarah, and I'll try to just answer it more neatly. So one of the, one of the well, quotes you shared talked about writing... Oh, yes, writing something about which you die. I would think this probably is true of quite a lot of people, to be honest. I mean, Mike Wall said, I can't see the point of life without writing. Um, I could think of somebody in the book who said, without writing, he doesn't know what he would do with his time. I think, yeah, I think once you've really... Um, it's so frightening at first, writing. Every act of writing is frightening. Every time you face the blank page, it's frightening. But every time you overcome it, and every library has said this, it's just that as you do a bit more, so you get a little bit more confident that actually, yes, you will be able to complete this thing. Or you will have the, have the sense to discard it if it really barely working. But yes, I think I'd have to ask them. But I think writing is that central, yes, for all the people in my book. Great. Thank you very much, Sue. And thank you for your um, very thoughtful questions as well. Um, Mick, is there anything you would like to close with just to, to round us off this evening? Um, I just want to say thanks to Sue again um, for, um, for such a, a, an interesting evening. I'm pleased to say I think I was right about, um, about the evening and the book, that it's offered a variety of um, answers to what it is to be an author and about the, the sources of creativity. And yet, Sue, you were also very tantalising in your, your introductions to each of, the, um, of, of your subjects. Thanks to everyone um, for their questions and contributions. Um, and I probably don't really need to invite you to visit the Serum website or the retailer of your choice. 
um, by the book. Um, perhaps in due course, we'll see you all in the flesh as we would originally intended before um, the pandemic struck. Let's hope so. But until then, uh, we wish you all a pleasant evening. Thanks for coming and, uh, and goodbye.